three, two, one, zero. We have to miss and we have to go on the two thirteen.
And they said, yes, we fished. And then Goofy let us ride the horses, and Goofy let us ride the tractor. <laughs> so I think Goofy actually applies to me better than Mickey. So anyway, that's the story there. All right. Little information about me. I was born in 1933 in my grandparents' farmhouse out in western Oklahoma during the Dust Bowl, of course. I started a school, grade school, first grade, near a little town near El Paso, Texas. When I graduated from high school in 1952, I had been to 13 different schools. So I did a little moving around as a kid. I, after graduating high school, I started college at Oklahoma A&M, which is now known as Oklahoma State. And by the way, there's one of my friends here that, uh, oh, he's back up here, that uh, also went to Oklahoma A&M. Graduated in January 1957, and almost immediately, my friends and neighbors selected me, and I went to work for my Uncle Sam for two years out of White Sands. Got out of the Army, worked for a year and a half for an oil company, and one of my friends said that NASA was hiring people. So I came up and interviewed, and sure enough, they were foolish enough to hire me. I initially worked on the Saturn V, trying to find out what, see what configuration we were going to go. There was, well, at that time, there was about 7,000 of us out there. Once the decision was made to go to the moon, then I was moving over into advanced studies where we were looking at what we're going to be doing after the Apollo program. And I finally ended up in the latter part of my career as a mission manager for a payload that did fly on the space shuttle. So I feel good. Heidi, stick your head back in here a minute. This is one of the other people that I said has been so much help to me and other panel moderators. Thank you, Heidi. Okay. Uh, let's put my yes, thank you. Let's put my first chart up, please. You've got a controller. You can switch. Well, they're supposed to do it up there. First chart. <laughs> you know, we had a dry run Monday to ensure that we had this all square away. shot right there of the Saturn V with the moon in the background and everything. The one on the right is the Apollo 11 launch. And if you were not around at that time frame, let me tell you, that was a exciting time. Have, uh, how many people got to see a Saturn V launch? A chance. Oh, a lot of you. Great. As you recall, it was awesome. You sit there and watch that Saturn take off, and you think, is it going to go? Is it going to go? And then finally it just keep going. And be loud. Oh, it was loud. <clears throat> okay, next chart, please. Just a breakout. Where's that? 
Okay, you got your first stage, which uh, Charlie Bishop is going to talk about. The second stage is the S2 stage. Spike is going to talk about it. The third stage, Volker. The instrument unit, right up, well, above the uh, third stage. We'll, they'll be talking about it. But just kind of gives you an idea. On up there on top, uh, there's a thing called a payload. And I forget what center worked on that. But thank you. One of our sister centers worked on that, I don't know what. But anyway, <laughs> no, they did a great job. Okay, next chart, please. Okay, uh, you're aware of the contractors that uh, built the stages and the engines. I wanted to put this up here with about the number of major support contractors, 283 of them. They were spread out over 27 of the states. Now these are the major subcontractors. There's hundreds of smaller uh, contractors that provided maybe little nuts and bolts or whatever. My guess is they were spread out over the United States. During the peak of the Apollo, there were like 20,000 companies supporting the Saturn V vehicle. And that's just the, co the companies supporting the Marshall Space Flight Center activities. There were 375,000, I've been told, industry people working this, 33,000 NASA people, 10,000 universities. Now, I can't verify those numbers, but I and believe them because there were a lot of people involved. This is a very, very complicated vehicle, something that had never been done before. Okay, next chart, please. I think you're all aware of this happening. That woke the United States up. But even prior to this, though, back in the 50s, there were the Navy and the Army, which the Army was a group was Dr. Von Brown at the uh, ABMA, they were looking at going to space. Dr. Von Brown had said we could beat the Russians, but he was told to cool it because the Navy was going to put up the first satellite using the Vanguard uh, missile. Well, in December of that year, Vanguard took off for two seconds and then exploded. They came back immediately to ABMA, Dr. Ron Brown company, said, can you get us a satellite up? He said, I'm good in two months. And his boss said, no, let's make it four months. So then uh, four months later, was when the United States put up their first satellite. And as I said, there were three military group looking to you, be the space people, if you will. Gen uh, General, well, General and President Eisenhower recognized that it was not a good thing to have the military being doing the space initiative. So that's when they had created the NASA organization. The Saturn program was put underneath it. The Mercury program was put underneath NASA. And of course, later on, we, when we did the Saturn V, it was underneath there also. Uh, again, back in the 50s, studies were being made to go to low Earth orbit, maybe even go to lunar, so on and so forth. But they decided that there was a need for a bigger engine that was existing at that time. And that's when they said, well, we needed an engine with one and a half million pounds of thrust, and then a contract was signed with Rocketdyne to build the F-1 engine. In late 59, there was the Silverstein Committee, and there were seven people on the committee, Dr. Von Braun was one of them. Silverstein had been a director at the Lewis Research Center, and he was a big proponent of using liquid hydrogen, said we needed something that had a higher 
specific impulse and what you can get out of using the LOX RP on the F1 engine. <coughs> Dr. Von Braun was first was sort of against it, mainly because it's so volatile and so cold, minus 423 degrees Fahrenheit. But in that committee, Von Braun did agree that yay barely we needed to have an engine using liquid hydrogen. So out of that, uh, the next uh, chart will show, but I don't want to show right now. There was a contract signed with North American to build the uh, J2 engine. But as a result of F the F1 engine and the Silverstein Committee, in January of 1960, NASA told Congress that we can do a circle lunar by 1970 and land on the moon shortly thereafter. President Eisenhower then gave his national priority rating to work on this Saturn program, and that included overtime, etc., etc., et Okay, as I said, and an important thing to all of us that uh, worked at Marshall, the Von Braun team was moved from ABMA to NASA in July the 1st of 1960. Now, there were 4,670 people moved over, engineers, secretaries, people that could fabricate, test, whatever is necessary. He believed strongly in getting your hands dirty, knowing what you're building and what the contractor may be building. And it's also interesting that after uh, President Kennedy was elected, he resurrected this National Aeronautics and Space Council and named Lyndon Johnson as the uh, chairman, who Lyndon was a very advocate of space. It's rather interesting if you look at the date. Two days later, Russia put up the first man in orbit. Needless to say, that got everybody's attention. One day later, President Kennedy called a meeting at the White House, said he wanted some action. Johnson sent out a letter to nine different people asking what could we do. Dr. Ron Brown came back and said we could put a man on the moon and bring him back by late 50, uh, 67. I think somebody again said let's little, put a little pad on this. So next chart. I think you're all aware of this speech that Kennedy gave to Congress saying we're going to land on the moon and bring him back safely within a decade. That's when things heated up. If you notice that uh, we had all three of the major contractors on board by the end of 61. I don't think you could do that today, but there was a lot of uh, hand wringing. Everybody got under going big time. Now we already had uh, Douglas Aircraft on the S-4 stage and they were told to modify that. Kind of interesting that the North American contract said we really haven't got our specifications and requirements down yet, so be prepared for some new things coming at you. And sure enough, they did. And Spike will talk about it. The lunar orbit. There were two ways. Well, actually, three ways. We're going to talk about two right now. Ways of going to the moon. One of them was a lunar orbit rendezvous, which was selected. The other was an Earth orbit rendezvous where you had to have two launches of the Saturn V, rendezvous in Earth, real Earth orbit, and then go on the moon. Uh, Dr. Von Braun agreed finally in early 62 that uh, we'd go to the lunar orbit rendezvous. And that had a big impact on the, on the stages about the lunar orbit. In fact, even though we selected the Saturn V configuration in this in January, in May there were three changes made. The S4 stage was told to go 40 inch, be built 40 inches bigger. The S2 stage was increased six and a half feet in length. The S1C stage was decreased three foot in length. <coughs> There were two decisions made. 
You know, the Apollo program, I think, was the most significant that could have been made, and they were very, very bold decisions on my head. Well, the first one was this all up testing. Dr. Miller came down from headquarters and said, hey, we need to go all up. People looked at him, I think, and said, are you crazy? There's no way. We've never done that before. Marshall had said it was going to be the 17th launch before we would land man on the moon. The all up testing, first stage, second stage, third stage, the instrument unit was live, the service module was live, Band module was live without being in it on the first test. Next chart. They finally agreed that that's what they would do. So, the first Saturn V launch was all up, unmanned, and it was success, very successful. We were all kind of amazed, I think. What do you think about this? Here we are, new technology and all this, and all of a sudden we're having a successful launch on this big beast. The second launch was, we had three anomalies. One was a pogo problem on the first stage. The second stage, two of the engines shut off premature. The third stage, J2, did not reignite. So needless to say, we got hot, heavy looking at what we need to do to fix that. And we did. Between these two launches here, there was a Saturn 1B was used to put the service module and command module up, manned at the low Earth orbit, and the crew stayed on board until the length of a lunar mission. The second decision that I was telling you about that was a bold one is this one right here. Now, can you imagine? Here you've had a couple of anomalies, and you're going to put men around the moon. Not land them on it, but put them in certain room. And they put made 10 orbits. And if I'm sure there's a lot of these old folks here that listened to it when Frank Warman and his crew read some passages from the Bible on Christmas Eve. And if that didn't bring tears to your eyes, you just had no feelings at all, the way I feel about it. Okay. The uh this was a low orbit. This one, we want to do a descent and an ascent test of the limb. They went down within nine miles of the lunar surface and then came back up, rendezvoused off with the command service model. I've heard rumor that Stafford was told if you land on the moon, you won't have enough fuel to come back up to the Serve the command module. Now, whether that's true or not, frankly, I believe it because those guys, you know, they were pretty, pretty wild. Okay. And then, anyway, the sixth launch when we landed man on the moon. Now, to me, that's amazing and brought him back safely. Mm -hmm. I might mention that uh, on this launch, the payload capability was like 80,000 pounds. By the time we got to flight 17, due to some improvements on the engines and weight reductions, we were up to 116,000 pounds. And we did have, uh, go, let's go to the next chart, please. These are all part of the Saturn program, and every one of the launch fields were successful. Now, some people would have said, whoa, Apollo 13 had a problem, and it did. The mission was not successful. But the launch vehicle part of it was successful, and we were quite proud of that. Next chart. Dr. Lucas was the center director when he made these statements about the Apollo program, and as you can see, he said it was greater, or as great as the Manhattan Project. Personally, I think it's greater, but uh, I'm prejudiced. But it is equivalent to what you've done with the Wright brothers. And the weight going capability in that 10 years, amazing how much it went up. You could spend hours talking about the management of this. There were some key people. Dr. Rudolph was the Saturn V project manager. And what they did, and a guy by the name of Bill Sneed, in coming up with the tracking system, all these parts. 
I've heard that there were something like 12,000 parts that had to be tracked and kept to where a big tree comes on large time. Technology fallout is another situation. I'll look at my phone on my hip and say, you know, this is part of that technology that came out of it. And 100% awesome. Okay. Oh, one other thing. Just a second, Charlie. Uh, when I started to work out there, <laughs> anybody in here not know what this is? Well, it's a slide rule that uh, all of us engineers had to use when we were in college. Now, this is a K&E, and all these uh, mechanical engineers use uh, K&E. It seems like there's another kind that electrical engineers I don't remember what it was. I don't even remember what it was. It was a post. Uh, okay. Now, as I said about the fact that we didn't have you got on our hip. So if you wanted to meet somebody, either you went over there office, they come over with yours, or you get on the phone and you pick it up, and you'd say, Amy Pearl, would you connect me with Charlie Bishop, please? I want to talk about the S1C stage. Charlie, would you please come up. I feel too long. I'm sorry about that. Thank you. Oh, by the way. Uh, there's, at the night after this, there's a beer garden that has German food to eat. There's also a band playing. And this guy's playing the trombone in it, so. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, next chart. Uh, okay, uh, my name is Charlie Bishop. Uh, I'm a retired Boeing Tech fellow. Uh, I came over to Huntsville back in 1965 after I got my bachelor's degree in electrical engineering and control system study and uh, came over to the Hick building and uh, shared an office with 300 of my closest friends. And uh, we worked on the control system for about, uh, I worked with them for about 10 years um, and finally got my, my uh, master's degree from UAH under Dr. C.D. Johnson, some of you may remember that name. And uh, then uh, I worked a total of about 47 years um, toward the end when I noticed that the glow from my accomplishments were getting dim and the shadows from my mistakes were getting long. I decided it was time to retire. Plus the fact that it, uh, it had uh, uh, started to interfere with my tennis plans, so I, I had to get out. <laughs> anyway, so that's what I did. I, I spent 25 years at Boeing, uh, a total of 47 years in, in business. Next chart, please. So, oops, what happened? Oh, okay. All right. Uh, okay, I, I want to talk to you about several things. The uh, uh, S1C stage itself, some data associated with it. I'm going to talk about a little bit about navigation guidance control. You're going to hear much more about that from Luke later on. Uh, I want to talk about the control system issues. I think those were a very important part of making sure that the Saturn V and the as a, as a whole worked. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about engine out. We had a, uh, we really had to have a, a ability to, to fly with an engine out. I talk a little about Pogo. And if you haven't heard of Pogo, we'll talk about what that is. And then I want to tell you my personal story about 508. So next chart, please. Uh, so here we have the Saturn V, and it's uh, let's see, where's the pointer? Am I missing the Oh, there it is. Uh, it, this is the S1C stage. The, uh, you have a, a rock tank and an RP1, RP1 tank. Uh, all five engines down there. And there's the fins were supposed to provide aerodynamic stability, and they did partially. They didn't 100% provide stability. Notice the retro rockets. The, those engines, after you cut the engines off out in space, those retro rockets were used to pull the stage away from the upper stage. If you didn't do that, the outgassing from the stage 
would push the first stage back up toward the second stage. So you had to pull, put those record pressure rockets on there to pull it away. Uh, this is a complex system to build and difficult to make work, but that's what we were on, that's what we were up to. Go ahead to the next chart. Uh, just some idea of how, how much power is associated with this thing. It had five engines. The four outer engines were gimbaled. That means they were able to be moved and angled to provide uh, torque to keep the vehicle pointed the direction you want it to point. Uh, the total thrust is seven and a half million pounds. It burned for about two and a half minutes. And the altitude at burnout was about 38 miles, which is way up in the atmosphere, so you didn't have to worry too much about atmospheric effects on the upper stages. And it going about 6,000 miles an hour. And the whole purpose of this thing was just to get that whole Saturn V upper stages out of the atmosphere and hit it out in the right direction, the right altitude, and the right speed. Next chart, please. All right, let's talk a little bit about the, the history of this stage. Uh, Boeing received a contract in December of 61, and they began work with Marshall. This was a close relationship. Uh, Marshall really had the capability to understand, and they had already started doing some general guidelines on how on the design of the uh, S1C stage. Boyd came in and helped them finalize the design, and then the actual production of stages was started at Marshall, with Boeing participating and learning and trying to add their technology to what Marshall's technology already was. They, the, the, let me talk about this for just a second. I may, I may be wrong about this, but I believe that this is the stage, the first stage that was manufactured was a, called a Pathfinder. And it was the one that was put together for the purpose of proving the methods and, and manufacturing processes associated with S1C. And I believe that's the one that we have hanging out here in the, in the hall. Uh, I, not everybody believed that. Okay, so there were other, there were three other stages that were non-flight stages that were built by at Marshall with Boeing help. Uh, the first one had five engines, and it had it was a test firing stage. That's the one. If you folks remember your windows shaking, that's the one that shook your windows. And in fact, uh, if, the, there was a weather inversion one time during a test, and people down in Birmingham complained about the windows shaking down there. So anyway, and then uh, these two stages, the, well, the, the structural test stage was actually put together to determine how structure, whether the structure would hold up under uh, the flight. There was a facility, a facility stage that was sent down to Cape Canaveral so they could do their testing of their facility. These two stages did not have engines. They were, then uh, the next two stages that were built were the 501 and the 502, which actually flew. Of course, uh, they were both unmanned. Now, at that point, the Michoud facility was activated for, for S1C, and the, and the tooling and uh, the capability to do the building was moved down to the Michoud plant. The Michoud plant needed to be uh, worked on quite a bit. The, the S1C stage was built in a vertical position. And, and uh, I suggest you go out there to that mock-up. It's hard to tell how, how big that, that S1C stage is if you're standing under here. But you go out to the mock-up and go, go stand up out there and look and see how big it is. So if you got a vertical stage that big, you're gonna have some high bay area that you have to work in. That had to be done at, uh, with Vichy, it wasn't quite ready to go. And uh, of course, Boeing, being Boeing, they, they had a price they had work going on there. Boeing came in and took 60% of the facility, you know, uh, <laughs> that's just the way they operate. Uh, so anyway, at that, after that, there was a, the first vehicle, the first, S1C stage built at Michoud was called a, uh, the dynamic test vehicle. That was the one that was brought up and put into the power and shape. And that one uh, had one engine and four weights to represent the engines. And this one, uh, what it did, it, it verified what the bending modes and the bending mode shapes and slopes and so forth were so that the attitude control system to those. Uh, the DTV Tower, if you don't know what that is, it's a big building out here from the Arsenal, 
at the time, it was, I think it was 36 stories tall, and it was the tallest building in Alabama at the time it was built. Anyway, they shook up, they had the whole three stages in, um, in that, and shook it, and then after that, now we started building flight stages. We built the 503 through 512, all of which flew on uh, manned missions. The 513 was the one that flew the sky lab. Uh, built two more stages, the 514 and the 515, that never got to fly. Uh, one of the things that was dramatic about this process was there was a good relationship between Boeing and NASA. Now, some people kind of, at Boeing, I'm sure, kind of chafed at the idea of the, the uh, a tremendous amount of attention they were getting from NASA. But the point of what really happened was the expertise that Marshall brought to this uh, S1C stage, along with Boeing's expertise in building big structures like airplanes that had to fly, this married very well together. And the bottom line is, uh, Milton Rosen, who at that time was the director of the launch vehicles and propulsion, said that with Boeing, all of Marshall's engineering and experience went into the S1C stage. So we got to take advantage of what Marshall had done prior to that. Uh, next chart, please. Okay, I want to talk about the control system a little bit. Uh, there's a lot of things we could talk about about this stage, and I couldn't talk about all of them, but this is the one that I worked on, so I thought I'd talk about that. Uh, navigation guidance control, or, or, or what it takes to put uh, a, 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 a payload in orbit and, in the moon, and on the moon. You're going to hear more about navigation and guidance. The only thing that I'm worried, I, 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 I use out of the navigation system was the attitude data. And uh, the uh, guidance actually was open loop. The open loop means that all we had was a pitch over table, a yaw table, and a roll table. We did not have closed loop guidance. They didn't want to do closed loop guidance on the first stage because going through the atmosphere is a rough deal. And try, if we didn't want any inadvertent transients to cause the vehicle to uh, break up as a result of that. So we kept it just a simple pitch over table. But the control system was really important because everything, as you're flying through the atmosphere, there's a lot of things that want to turn the vehicle away from the way it's going. One of the main things is the atmosphere itself, the, the aerodynamics. You have wind gusts and wind. I, don't, and I want to talk some more about what all those effects are. But go to the next chart, please. So this is what the control system really had to do. Uh, it took those attitude commands and the attitude that, that we came out, out of, came out of the IU and the attitude rate, and they were processed through analog gains and filters that we came up with. Uh, I actually worked on those analog gains and filters, and we once we got the, the uh, filter circuits and the gains, we passed that on to IBM and they, put, they implemented those in the flight control computer. Uh, the things that are happening to you during the, during the first stage flight are the aerodynamic forces of Boeing. a tremendous amount of aerodynamic forces on this vehicle. Uh, the mass data of the vehicle, it has a, a, a center of mass and moment of inertia that's very large. The, the, the center of mass errors can be large. The, the moment of inertia can change rapidly. The propellant, an oxidized tank slosh, not only that, but the, the, uh, we have to deal with the slosh of the upper stage tanks as well, hydrogen and oxygen in the upper stage, and uh, that, was, that caused us some interesting problems. The vibration modes, the vehicle, this is a large, flexible vehicle, and there were four main modes that we had to deal with, and I'm not, I can't picture those with my hands, but there were, there were uh, it turns out that those had to be stabilized, uh, and then we had the, um, the sensor and actuators themselves had a response that we had to compensate for. We had a bunch of disturbances that tried to move the vehicle away from where it was going. Now, as I said one time, that it, it's great to have all this power, but if you can't keep that power pointed in the direction you want it to go, it's not going to do you a lot of good. The kind of disturbances that we run into is the aerodynamics and the, at one point during flight the, actual, the vehicle was actually aerodynamically unstable and the control system had to stabilize it. 
the, um, the mass data changes and the bending data changes, if we have to design, design a system, a control system that would handle all of that. Uh, the uh, wind velocities, we, at one point, at some time during the year, February, mainly in March, you could be flying through the jet stream. So if you got 150 mile an hour winds, 200 mile an hour winds, it's possible at that. So you, and the thing about wind on a vehicle this large is as you're passing through the wind and the wind is changing, that's a shear on the vehicle. And it causes the, the forces maybe high at the top and then get uh, walk down the vehicle. So it tends to turn the vehicle. And then you have gusts as well. Uh, there's little differences in thrust between the engines. They tend to make the, the vehicle want to turn. And uh, the angle of the engines is not always perfect. And then finally, we were asked to make sure that we could fly with one outboard engine out. And get the vehicle up to where it needs to go. That doesn't mean we're going to be able to get to the moon if we have that engine out. But we at least want to have a safe flight into orbit with one engine out. Uh, and uh, this, it turns out, interestingly enough, that we uh, were able to design one control system, one set of gains and filters that worked for the first 100 seconds. Then we had to switch gains between at 100 seconds and again at 130 seconds to make it work all the way up to through the whole two and a half minutes of flight. And that same set of gains and filters worked for the entire Apollo program. We did not have to re revisit those games and filters. So that, that's, if you, the people who do uh, control system work call that robustness. And we, we feel pretty good about robustness on that. Go to the next chart, please. Now, engine out. This is one of the critical things that is very, was very difficult, a very difficult problem for us to solve. There were two critical times that we had to deal with. The first was with an engine out at six seconds after launch. Now, six seconds after launch was critical because if you had an engine out prior to six seconds after launch, you didn't have enough thrust to make the vehicle go up. So the vehicle would come back down. So once you got to six seconds, you had enough forward momentum and enough thrust to keep the vehicle going. And that would cause, uh, that, that caused a lot of variation in the attitude and the control and the flight of the vehicle. And, and if you had that kind of an engine out, you just take it and go to, go to orbit or astronauts be safe in orbit, but you probably will not go to the moon with that. The other time that is very important is what, what's called max Q, maximum dynamic pressure. As the vehicle builds up uh, pressure on the front as it's flying, it gets higher and higher, that pressure becomes very, very high, and that's when all the aerodynamic forces and moments are the highest, is that max Q. So the, at that time, what we did in our simulations to show, that, to show that we could handle that, we actually put an engine out at max Q, and we put a maximum wind and a maximum gust and a maximum shear all at the same time, forcing that vehicle over. And with what we found out the first time we did this is our gains weren't high enough. We had to get higher gains in order to make this stable. Now, Raising the gains is good, but then you've got to get all that back down again to get stable at higher frequencies, get the bending mode stable, get the, get the, the attitude control stable. So that created um, some interesting work to try to get that all done. We put all that through our simulations, our six off simulations, and we had confidence before the vehicle flew that we would be able to uh, uh, fly with safety, with one engine out at any time during the, after six seconds of flight. Next chart, please. Okay, Pogo. I don't think you can talk about uh, this program without talking about Pogo. Uh, what Pogo is, basically, is the vehicle has, uh, I should have brought a slinky with me to show you what this is, but the vehicle actually has a vibration mode that's on a longitudinal vibration mode. So it, it bounces up and down, the back and the front back bounce together. When that happens at certain areas of the vehicle, that causes flow rates to change to the engine. When those flow rates change to the engines, the thrust from the engines changes. 
And if those two things get in sync, the bouncing and the thrust changing, get to the right phase, it can just get bigger and bigger and bigger and finally break the vehicle. And this could be dangerous. So what, uh, what we did is that what, what, what happened there is that on the 502, this first time it really was recognized for, for the Saturn V was on 502, and flew in April of 68, and they had about 10 seconds of this pogo that occurred late in flight. And at the time, looking at the flight data, we didn't think that was a whole big deal. But then we got to thinking about it. You know, we don't really know what might have happened. And so they, they formed a, a team. Uh, and this is where I think some of the best cooperation took place. It, was, it consisted of Marshall and Na other NASA personnel, uh, contractors that involved, and that was not only Boeing, but all of the subcontractors and we had all the stage contractors were involved because the upper stages had some similar type things going on. And other industry personnel and the universities. We got help from all of the, from the, the universities who had expertise in this as well. And that team worked together and looked at a lot of options and finally came out with what was basically a shock absorber type of thing in the box lines to keep the, to damp out the uh, vibrations. In August 68, that solution was tested at the Mississippi Test Facility and it proved to work. And then this and fixes to failures, other failures on that on that 502 helped position the program for the Apollo 8 moon flight in December of 68. Now I want to go ahead, next chart, please. Uh, I I want to tell you this story. Um, I, I've I've always been impressed by the teamwork that occurred between Boeing, NASA, and the other contractors on this program. If it hadn't been for that teamwork, we wouldn't have been there. But this was a particular case that, I, I, that really struck me. In early in 68, General Sam Phillips uh, defined a, uh, sent out a memo to all the people and said, we want you guys to uh, look at these various options from a low Earth orbit to a higher Earth orbit uh, to a moon bypass, moon orbit, and look at all of these things and see if the if the C prime mission for 503 will which one of those to choose. Now, if we can't solve a lot of these problems we've seen on the vehicle up to now, we'll just go with that low Earth orbit. If we can start solving some of these problems, we'll go to those higher more complex missions, and if we get this thing all solved, we get everything done that we think we need to do, we'll go to the moon in December, and we'll put people in orbit around the moon. Well, everybody on my team, and everybody that I knew, and everybody I worked with, seemed to take the attitude that if we don't go to the moon in December, it won't be my fault. And everybody tried to solve the problems that they were faced with, they cooperated in solving those problems, and sure enough, we wound up for one moon in August and December, and we listened to the astronauts read from Genesis on December on Christmas Day, and I sat, <laughs> I'm sorry, this is emotional for me. I sat in my parent, grandparents' living room watching this on TV with tears running down my face. I think anybody that was associated with that felt the same way. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. We appreciate that. Okay, the next speaker is going to be Spike Field, who's sitting over here, and I'll bring the microphone to him. Sit down, Spike. You want to get up? Okay. Can you just have a hand? No. Good afternoon. My name is Spike Field. Uh, I was a, uh, a Georgia Tech Bramlin rep, class of 54, and got a master's at MIT under the Sloan program. I was the S2 project manager 
from the uh, day that the uh, uh, bids went out, or the bidders came in for a conference and stayed with the program until mid-65. Uh, I'm going to sit down to give the talk. You might appreciate that. Next slide, please. Next. The, uh, on the, under the S-2 contract, until the lunar orbit rendezvous decision was made in late 62, North American worked on preliminary S-2 designs and trade-off studies for Marshall. The contract statement of work was basically read, design and develop a, a LOX hydrogen upper stage, 33 feet in diameter, with five J2 engines and one million pounds of propeller. Uh, also provide test hardware, a battleship, and four uh, flight weight uh, test ground vehicles. And finally, deliver 10 flight stages. Five are added later. Next slide. Next slide. This is uh, the cutaway of the uh, S2. Uh, it illustrates the hydrogen tank above the oxygen tank, separated by a common bulkhead. We'll talk a lot about that common bulkhead. Five engines on a, on a conical thrust structure, and there's a four and a half interstate. Next slide. There were some special features for the S2. One was dual plane separation, uh, a, a common bulkhead, explosive forming, external insulation, and a lightweight structure. Next slide. This is the uh, Saturn V uh, sequence of uh, separation. Uh, the, uh, after the S1C's C engines uh, uh, shut down and the rubber rockets were fired, uh, the S2 first plane separated, the J2 engines were fired up, and the S2 flew with the aft interstage attached. It flew like that for about 25, uh, 25 seconds before the second plane separated. And then the S2 flew on it for about 550 more seconds uh, until its engines uh, shut down, uh, followed by the S4 stage separation. There were, next slide, please. Uh, this is the uh, a view of the photograph of the uh, as to uh, second plane separation, uh, you uh, uh, might see a, a short movie version of it upstairs in the IU display station. Separations were initiated by detonating a linear shape charge. Next slide, please. There were a, a few management uh, problems. Uh, the, the, the most significant one was there were two major NASA jobs at North American Space Division. That was a big problem. Uh, the, the Seal Beach facility at, uh, in California was built specifically for the S2, but it was under construction uh, and it took time to get beneficial occupancy. And then during the, the course of the development, uh, the uh, both jobs, both the uh, the spacecraft and the S-2 got progressively behind schedule and by late 64, NASA headquarters started playing a role in an over, over, overseeing the, with the work done at North America. Next slide. Having a uh, Marshall resident office uh, 
working groups and quarter reviews uh, were standard operating procedure at Marshall. Uh, and as the uh, schedule delays in, in the late 64 became a serious concern, and uh, Major General Sam Phillips uh, led Tiger Team incursions into the North American plants that continued for uh, several years. The so-called uh, Phillips Report was a stern letter that was sent to Lee Atwood, who's the uh, North American corporate president. And the result of that uh, was that a new project manager was brought in from the Air Force, and he brought some management techniques that they had used successfully on uh, Air Force uh, programs. A couple of years later, the uh, Bob Greer, the uh, second S2 project manager, uh, commented, uh, and I quote, Marshall's ubiquitous engineers and direction reached the point where North Americans' attempt to catch up were snarled by NASA's red tape. Some of you may appreciate that. Next slide, please. The, the S2 technical uh, challenges, uh, principally the common, common bulkhead assembly, uh, the weight reduction uh, was imposed on the uh, uh, S2 uh, uh, solely, and uh, uh, that uh, was a bone of contention for a while. Uh, the uh, insulation uh, on the LH2 tank was a nagging problem and it continued for several years until it finally got resolved. And then there were, there were some ground test failures that happened. Next slide, please. This uh, illustrates the position of the common bulkhead in the tanks. It, it's uh, made up of uh, 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 forward and aft facing sheets and a honeycomb core. Uh, the facing sheets uh, are comprised of 12 doors that were welded together, and then the two facing sheets were joined with a uh, honeycomb core, and I'll describe that process. Uh, next slide, please. This is a photograph of the uh, uh, common bulkhead uh, assembly floor. Uh, the pie-shaped doors that you see over here were about eight and a half feet across and about 18 feet across the surface to the apex. Uh, they, they were made of eight inch thick aluminum sheet stock and uh, uh, they were contoured uh, from the bottom all the way to the top. Uh, I might add that some of the bulkheads uh, were eight inch here and uh, the aft uh, facing sheet was beefed up in this area here, no, and I'll describe that. The, uh, the, the, the shape of the gores was accomplished by exploding prime cord located above an aluminum sheet submerged in water. The explosion pressed it into the steel die, thereby forming the core's smooth contoured shape. Next slide, please. Don't uh, let all the coal outs confuse you. Uh, this diagram is shown just to show the, the F facing sheet as opposed to the forward facing sheet. They're joined together with the, uh, with the uh, honeycomb in between. But the point of this diagram is to, to explain that these facing sheets were very thin. The uh, well land was an eighth of an inch. That was the sheet stock used uh, on both both of these, except for this uh, waffle area. And the uh, in the case of the forward uh, facing sheet, the thickness varied from the top down to the bottom by going from about 105 thousandths thickness up here 
down to 30,000 down here. All accomplished. The, the machining was done by what do you call it? Chem milling. It was a chemical process. But to do a, 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 a tapered uh, contour like that, or tapered uh, uh, chem mill, was, was a little tricky. It take, takes a lot of various dippings. The um, the affixing sheet uh, sheet was um, uh, had, had around the equator had waffle sections and they were about four and a half inches deep uh, and it happened also on the lower on the aft uh, bulkhead and that was because the, that area of the equator. Uh, is where a lot of the launch loads are taken out uh, and going up the, the stage structure. And uh, in order to maintain stability of the bulkhead, that, that had to be beefed up in that area. But the forward bulkhead was relatively thin. It was, it was all the way. It was a, a, a very uh, flexible body. Next slide, please. I'll, uh, I'll try to explain it, uh, this. Uh, I've reviewed it several times to come up with this, which I think might be a little more helpful. The half-facing sheet, uh, which is the bottom of the common bulkhead, was expanded by low-pressure air to allow mapping of the surface uh, trace dimensions. Uh, the honeycomb segments uh, were machined to fit that uh, mapping surface. Uh, so that they could match fit the uh, uh, the, uh, the the facing sheet, and they were bonded then to the uh, expanded aft facing sheet as as it was sitting uh, on, on the uh, on the on the tool. A huge vacuum bell was used to suck the forward facing sheet into its full contoured position, and surface dimensions were mapped from that inside. Of that dome. The honeycomb was then machined uh, as it was sitting on top of the aft facing sheet to match fit the forward facing sheet surface data. Adhesive was applied and the forward facing sheet, still in the vacuum bell, was lowered onto the prepared honeycomb surface. The vacuum bell was sealed at the bottom, pressure and heat applied, and the common bulkhead assembly was cured in its huge autoclave. I don't know how that changed. The finished assembly was ultrasonically inspected and verified by the old-fashioned method of tapping with a coin and listening for variations. The, this uh, photograph, oh, go back, there we go. Uh, this half facing sheet illustrates the smooth surface that the honeycomb uh, was bonded to. Now we can go. Next slide. Uh, wells uh, were a problem. It took a while to uh, resolve some of them. The 2014 T6 aluminum alloy uh, is, it was difficult to weld, but it had a higher strength when exposed to cryogenic temperatures, which is why uh, it was used. Uh, and help to make it a, a lighter stage. The um, LX2 uh, tank to common bulkhead well, J well, uh, was a big challenge. It was a circumferential well with a quarter inch uh, uh, well land. And then the, uh, the stage had it over a half a mile of wells. Uh, throughout the whole uh, uh, hy the hydrogen and LOX tank uh, portion of the stage. And finally, we, we found that the best way to get a quality well consistent was uh, to uh, do all the operations uh, in one pass. Next slide, please. The skate tracking the uh, skate what we call the escape welder uh, was rotated around the fixture to make the, the irradial wells on each of the doors. And uh, 
Is it trimming, welding, and x-ray inspection all done in one pass? That was the best way to make sure we had quality welds. Next slide. No, no. Yeah, I flipped the page too far. All right, well, that's right. Okay, on weight reduction. The total S2 weight uh, was reduced to uh, 8,077 pounds. And as material was shaved off, the load margin of safety approached zero. And the S2 became the most efficient upper stage in history with a mass fraction of 0.926, a record that still stands as far as I understand. Next slide, please. External insulation was used uh, uh, in order to uh, keep the uh, 2014 T6 cold as the, as the liquid hydrogen itself, minus 423 degrees F. Uh, Insulation was required to reduce the boil off during loading and countdown holds. Uh, the helium purge panels on, on the uh, left tended to debond after multiple cryogenic loadings. Uh, and the straight, straight on foam insulation alternative wasn't realized until later in the program. Next slide. Insulation uh, reduced boil off during loading. Uh, let's see. I, oh, I got, I got the wrong one there. The, 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 the helium perch panels were uh, used on all stages through S25. However, frequent repairs became necessary at MTF, which, which was uh, did not help the schedule at all, uh, but the, uh, uh, it, it, it did cause uh, a lot of problems, uh, inclu including boil off. Foam became the insulation material of choice by Apollo 13, and it, it's noted that 100% foam reduced the boil off rate by a factor of two in going from the panels to the, to the uh, foam. Next slide. This is it. You change. Uh, this change order modified the ground test program by deleting the dynamics test stage and routing flight stages to the new Mississippi test facility for acceptance testing. The purpose was to reduce the amount of hardware in the pipeline and hopefully uh, get deliveries earlier. The change order also led to unexpected uh, consequences. Next slide. This is a picture of the uh, all systems vehicle S2T, and it was redesignated S2T slash D. It's supposed to have uh, double duty for dynamic testing. Uh, and it was shipped to MTF aboard the Navy's landing ship dock, USS Point Barrow. It took two weeks to make the, the voyage going through the Panama Canal. Next slide. S2 had two significant ground test failures. The structural test vehicle, uh, S S2, uh, S2S slash D, uh, which it became an alternate for uh, doing dynamic testing, failed at 144% of limit load on the aft skirt. Uh, it, it happened near the end of the test program. Uh, because it was 144, it was very, very close to the design limit load, and test results were uh, analyzed, and it, and it was demonstrated, it, it, the stage test demonstrated optimum design and verified structural integrity. Uh, this, this kind of, Cutting it that short or close uh, contributed to why the stage was so light. The all systems test vehicle S2T 
redesignated S2 D after the uh, uh, structural vehicle failed. Uh, that was shown in the last photograph. Had four short duration firings at MTF, leading up to two long duration firings. Uh, one of the long durations got cut uh, short, uh, but it was uh, the data was still valid. It was uh, it was destroyed uh, about about a week after the last test. Uh, when an empty uh, uh, LOX, uh, hot, rather hydrogen tank exploded due to overpressurization. In, in spite of these uh, major hardware losses, test efforts that had not been completed on either one of them were, tra was, were transferred to subsequent hardware in the pipeline. Next chart, please. On the left, you see the uh, S2 being loaded on the A2 test stand at MTF, and on the right, the S2 is being lowered onto the S1C in the, in the vertical assembly building. Next chart. Now, looking back on the uh, project, uh, Dr. George E. Miller uh, made this statement that the S2 was the pacing item and most difficult Saturn Apollo development. Uh, and and uh, I think anybody who worked on the project uh, kind of felt that it may have been the most difficult. Uh, the common bell kit size, uh, 33 feet in diameter, an ellipsoidal shape presented welding, tooling, and assembly methods that took time to develop. And that was probably the, the major reason for a lot of our schedule delays. Most manufacturing difficulties, however, were resolved by S25 or Apollo 10. And in the end, S2 supported an unprecedented 100% successful Saturn V launch record. agree with what you said about the S2 was probably the most difficult stage to build here. Next we're going to hear from Volker Roth about the S4B stage. By the way, uh, I believe you came over here in 1945 with your parents? 46. 46. Yeah, I came to join my father along with my other siblings and uh, my mother at that time. Great move. <laughs> okay, I'm going to uh, talk to you a little bit about the, uh, the S-4B. Uh, again, the story begins with the S-4 and then uh, goes to the S-4B uh, you know, uh, for the 1B vehicle and then for the S-4B for the set 5 vehicle. So there are three distinctly different stages uh, with a lot of similarities you know, in all of them. Um, I started with the company in, uh, in 1965. Uh, this activity began before I was uh, you know, part of the company. Uh, need to keep it closer. Yeah, I can, I can get the feedback. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> At any rate, uh, I started uh, you know, my career uh, basically by going to the University of Southern California and getting one of the first degrees they issued in aerospace engineering and uh, took that with me down to the Douglas Aircraft Company, you know, where you know, I started. Uh, my intent there was to go uh, work on the S4B and the Saturn program, because I knew they were going to be, uh, they were in the process of doing some of the work. Uh, let's go to the next chart, please. I wanted to talk about the, uh, the initial contract because uh, it was uh, a fairly important you know, activity, and there's a message here that I want to uh, share with other people that view this presentation and uh, are involved in our business today. Uh, the government got together, the uh, ABMA and uh, the, the uh, NASA people, and they had a, uh, a, a conference, basically, <clears throat> where they were trying to decide how they were going to procure the vehicles. Initially, they thought they would procure the vehicles from the bottom of the stack on up. 
but they realized pretty quickly that there was a common thread through all of that, which was you know what became the S4B. And as a result, they uh, they ended up uh, inviting 20 companies to bid on the S4 contract. Uh, Dr. Von Brown decided that rather than just put out the procurement, uh, he would identify the companies that he thought had a chance to be able to do this kind of work at that scale. Um, the bidders conference was in January, the end of January, and. Uh, the proposals were due 30 days later. Now, if you look at the way things work today, it uh, doesn't work like that, you know, period. There were 12 bids received, uh, you know, from the, the 20 vendors that had been invited. And uh, the time that NASA took to, eval to evaluate all of those proposals was less than three months. So within a three-month time, they had read them all, they had scored them all, and they made a decision and set that up. And Douglas was announced as the uh, winner of the competition on the 26th of May of 1960. As there are today, there was uh, a GAO investigation you know, conducted after that to make sure that everything was done right, and they came back within a month and confirmed the contract. So the entire process, basically, to get Douglas on contract took four months. Now, we're going to have to start thinking a little bit about doing you know, business at that speed if we're going to you know, meet the requirements that our current administration has you know, for NASA. So we, we probably will never be able to get back to this kind of speed, but there's some things that can be done to make it an awful lot more efficient. Next chart, please. Okay, so the first thing that came up was the, uh, the S4. And if I can figure out how to push the proper button and point it in the right direction. The, uh, the point here was that Marshall had developed the basic booster vehicle and uh, had done most of the work there. Later on in the program, the uh, you know, moved that over to uh, Chrysler, and Chrysler did uh, most of the builds, builds. But the S-4 was the second stage that was intended then to you know, get the vehicle into orbit. What the purpose was for the S-1 you know, vehicle, its primary mission was to launch Apollo test hardware to LEO and demonstrate the LOX LH2 performance of a large stage. Up to this point in time, there had been very little use of LOX LH2 on, uh, on rocket you know, programs, especially of the magnitude of this. And so there were a lot of things to learn about that, how those two liquids uh, interacted or did not interact and how you had to keep them separate, basically. That vehicle had six Pratt & Whitney RL-10 engines. And uh, we selected a common bulkhead, like Spike was talking about, because it uh, had a 20% 20, 20 gain in capability of the stage by going to that. We had done some similar work in the past on a vehicle called Thor, and we had a pretty good idea how we were going to accomplish that. And it was still a very difficult task, but it was nowhere near as hard as the task Spike talked about, because we had a hemispherical shape to our dome that made it a lot easier to construct, but it still required an awful lot of hand work. The, uh, <clears throat> the, the composite structure that was in between the two sheets of uh, metal ended up actually having to be sanded by hand to exact specifications so that when the, when the top sheet was brought down, you got the proper bond in there. And for a space vehicle that side, hand sanding was Awesome. <laughs> the other thing that we had to decide is uh, how we were going to insulate our tank. You know, Spike told you the S2 uh, went with external insulation. We had Boeing at, uh, at McDonnell Douglas and at Douglas before that. I worked for all three companies. You know, I'm interchanging those three companies, basically. Um, the, the, uh, the point was that uh, We had to keep the liquids in the state, 
uh, required for combustion in the engine for a much longer time than the other stages because eventually what we were going to be doing is going to orbit, coasting in orbit for four and a half hours and then relighting. And so we had to protect that propellant from boil off. Uh, you know, people talk about boil off and you, you don't really grasp most of the time how difficult that is. For example, when we filled the tank on the S4B with liquid hydrogen, we had to pour a total quantity of the tank of liquid hydrogen in there before we got everything down to a low enough temperatures that would actually stay in the tank. So there's a lot of boil off you know, that goes into that system and that's why the insulation is so important. The other thing is the locks down below is at a higher temperature basically and so what you have to be very careful of is that you don't get any cold spots otherwise you're going to freeze locks in the tank below. So uh, you know, our approach to all of that was uh, to find through research, and we did a whole lot of research on, on uh, insulation that could be put inside the tank, and one of the best that we found was balsa wood. The only problem was we didn't know what the supply was. We actually sent a small team out to find out what the supply was, and it turned out that we were going to have to have the entire harvest of uh, balsa wood from South America to take care of the program that we were trying to build. And then we found out that it didn't have all the consistencies that you needed for it to be consistent across the board as an insulator. So what Douglas did is they, uh, they went about generating something akin to uh, the balsa wood. And what they did, they basically took fiberglass fibers and built a, a uh, square cage and then put polyurethane in there and cured it. And we made you know, basically discs that were about 50 inches long and cut them out to fit inside that tank in the waffle pattern, which I haven't talked about yet. Uh, the, the S4B vehicle was in, in, intended to be a structurally sound vehicle. Previous vehicles had uh, been very thin skinned and they had to have pressure inside in order to be moved and erected you know, without uh, buckling. What we did is we took aluminum and we uh, basically cut it out you know, with a uh, cutting mill, had a very large mill in the triangular shapes uh, like a waffle pattern would be. So the whole inside of that tank was a waffle pattern and it turned out that worked out just perfectly for the insulation because we could cut the insulation, fit it into the waffle pattern and overlap it over the lands of the, of the, uh, uh, of the uh, waffle pattern. Once that was in place and glued in place, we put uh, fiberglass sheet over the top of it so it got a perfectly smooth surface on the inside of the tank. And that turned out to do the trick and we had no debonding problems or anything like that. And it was able to hold the liquids apart for as long as we needed. Uh, another thing that was uh, you know, kind of an interesting point is you know, once, once we built these tanks, we had to hydrostatically test them. And the objective was to test them to 5% over you know, the design you know, load. And the system was put together to do that test and to monitor everything with uh, sensors all over, pumps to pump the water in you know, to the, the right levels. And it was nothing but trouble. You know. There were too many areas where you couldn't, you, know, you, you, you couldn't make the, the pressure stay exactly where you wanted. You're getting bad readouts, etc. And so we struggled for a while with it. And then we got a bunch of smart people in a room together, and someone came up with the idea: Why don't we do it like we used to do it 30 years ago? You put a standpipe into the tank, and you run the standpipe up high enough so it, the only pressure you can get when you fill it up is, is when the standpipe is full of water and starts leaking water over the top. Perfect system, yeah. Now, how are we going to get that built? Well, it turns out we had to cut a hole in the top of the building. We had to put a 43 meter long you know, pipe out through the building, attach lights to it so the planes wouldn't run into it, put a cage over it so the birds wouldn't make nests in it, and it worked like a champ. 
So the message for the people doing business in the future, don't, don't ever just forget about the past. There are things that are really, really smart that have been done in the past. Then we talk a minute about going up to uh, Sacramento. Uh, Douglas had a test facility up in Sacramento, and that's where we take the finished stages and do you know, the, the interim tests and then also the final acceptance test. Um, the, the Marshall, pro, the NASA program, and it, it really was the Marshall program at that time, uh, was very strong on doing testing. I think it came from the German heritage. They had learned that if you didn't test things pretty well all the way through, that you got a lot of surprises. And if you got failures in the process of testing, it made the end system better. So better to find something on a test than when you launch it the first time is the basic theory. At any rate, because we were dealing with liquid hydrogen and uh, liquid oxygen, there was a lot of anxiety about how those two would mix when you were doing a lot of testing and there were technicians on the stand and so on. And there again, the old adage has come true. What's simplest is really the best. What they're worried about a lot is that they would get a hydrogen leak and it would catch fire. And if it caught fire and then caused an explosion, the flame is invisible. And so you got technicians around on the stage and they need to be safe, obviously. What they did is they took a broom and they carried a broom with them in front of them. And if the broom caught fire, you turned around and got the heck out of there because there was a fire there. It's the only way you could tell there was a fire there. So I just thought that was kind of an interesting story about how things are done. And Spike reminded us that that was used in the Navy for you know, some other purposes as well. High pressure steam. High pressure steam, yeah. At any rate, um, <clears throat> going on, uh, I made the comment about the testing on the S4 vehicle. We did have a situation of an overpressure on the LOX tank when we were doing that testing up at Sacramento, and we blew up a stage. Okay, the whole stage went kaboom. Well, it turned out we had really you know, put a lot of uh, instrumentation on that stage. It was the first time there had ever been an explosion of that side size other than during the launch with the Centaur, you know, that went up at high altitude. So there was no data on, you know, what actually happened. We found out exactly what happened to that stage and, and what the mechanism was. And as a result, we were able to make changes to the way we did our testing there. We went to an automatic testing mode that solved all those problems that created the overpressure, basically. And for that type of instance, you know, we didn't have the problem anymore, thank heaven. Okay, next day, uh, chart, please. So I go now to the S-1B vehicle, and uh, there again, we provided the uh, second stage you know, to the S-1B vehicle. The purpose of that vehicle, its primary mission, you know, was to launch full-scale Apollo hardware into LEO and to demonstrate the restart capability of the J-2 engine. So the first thing that was different about this vehicle, we took away the, the six RL-10 engines that Pratt and Whitney had provided that you know, performed perfectly well, but was cumbersome in terms of all the, uh, the, the you know, fluid pipes, etc., and went to the J-2 engine, a single engine you know, was replacing those uh, six uh, motors. The diameter of the vehicle changed by a meter from 5.6 meters to 6.6 .6 meters because we needed more capability. And the length of the vehicle changed by two meters as well. So it was a much bigger stage to accomplish the purpose that we had for it. Uh, in order to provide the, uh, the four and a half hour coast and, and low earth orbit, we had to add alleged uh, motors to keep the propellants settled, baffles inside the tanks to make sure the, that the, uh, the, the uh, propellant in the tanks stayed where we needed it to be, and we changed our venting system to be a propulsive venting system to utilize the, the, uh, the boil off uh, in, in a positive sense to keep the propellant settled again. 
That then allowed us to have all the propellants in the bottom of the tank where the pumps would pick it up and start that engine. Uh, the other thing we did is we, uh, we came up with a design for a propellant utilization system. And uh, it was a you know, fairly unique system with a pole that went through each one of the tanks that would measure the, the uh, levels of the propellant in the tank as the vehicle burned. And we actually uh, you know, sent it over to uh, Seal Beach and uh, you know, Spike's team over there. Uh, we provided that propellant utilization system for their tanks as well. It worked out very, very well. Next chart, please. Okay, then we went, uh, I think you skipped one. There should be one in there with the, uh, the large pellet. That's it right there. Okay, this is the Saturn V vehicle now. And on the Saturn V, we were in the third stage of the vehicle. And we had a fairly complex task in terms of what all we had to accomplish there. Obviously, we added the new interstage. It had to be a larger interstage. It went from our stage down to the S2. Uh, there was a very significant uh, difference there. And uh, again, this, uh, the, there was an incident that came up with this particular stage as well. And I'll talk about this before I mention any more of the, the changes. Um, in this case, it was a flight vehicle that we had taken up to Sacramento and done the flight you know, acceptance test on it. And a pretty good ways into the test, there was a huge explosion that destroyed the entire stand and destroyed the vehicle. And uh, the uh, study that we did on what happened there pinpointed the source of the problem. We, uh, Douglas, had a subcontractor who did the welding of the spheres that sat around the outside of the uh, thrust structure uh, by the J2 engine. And one of those vendor, or that vendor, had gone to the bin and gotten the titanium rod that they thought was the right one to weld those tanks, and it turned out they got the wrong rod. So it was a quality control and a process engineering problem that created that situation. But like I said again, yeah, the value of doing that level of testing on flight hardware is if that kind of thing happens, much better to have it happen on the ground than have it happen in flight and lose an entire mission. So because of the, the point in time in the program that we had there, we ended up taking that task back internal where we had good quality systems that would assure that would not happen again and built the rest of the tanks there. Let's see, the, uh, this, this version of the S4B uh, had the responsibility, obviously, to get the, uh, the vehicle into the final LEO orbit and then coast until we hit the right window to go on to the moon. Then they restarted that vehicle and it to, uh, put it on the lunar trajectory to, uh, to take the CSM and the LEM toward the moon. At that point, we ended up holding attitude while the CSM undocked, turned around and docked with the uh, lunar module. And then we, with our S4B control system, backed our vehicle off of that ensemble and moved it off to one side. And it was then propulsively vented and the APS system was used to send it off on, into a solar orbit. Later on in, uh, in life, in, in these missions, <clears throat> the, uh, the astronauts had taken a seismograph and planted it on the moon. And they uh, came to us and said, is there some way you could take that S4B and give us an earthquake? And uh, we went about doing that uh, by you know, retargeting the S4B after it was uh, done with its mission and ended up impacting the moon several times. And I hope, uh, Luke, uh, you'll yeah, make some, some comments about what we learned out of that many years later. Because that data was kind of, you know, no one did much with it until fairly recently. Okay, next chart, please. Okay, and so in summary, uh, 
the, the program, the S4B program was extremely successful. And I, it was the first, it was, it was kind of the stalwart stage of the Saturn program. Uh, we had no mission failures. The, uh, the robust design that we came up with, it, with to begin with was able to be applied to all, of the, all three of the missions that we eventually ended up having to use it for. Uh, we uh, we uh, had a lot of interface with our co other contractors to uh, to add you know the, add to their capabilities where we had something special. And I want to say something about the, the uh, interface that we had with Marshall Space Flight Center. You know, we, we were very fortunate in that we uh, had an interface there, you know, to begin with that was fairly good. And we worked very closely with them over the years. They had a resident manager at our location. Uh, we had people that came to Marshall that would make sure that information was transferred in a timely fashion. And as a result, yeah, you know, that whole thing came together, you know, very well. It's not just a matter of having people there; it's a matter of having people that have respect for each other, yeah, and that uh, can can end up working together, because it can make a huge difference, yeah, if if you're working closely together with your uh, customer and contractor. And then, as a parting shot for the the Apollo program, yeah. The, our vehicle was robust enough that we could make it into the first space station and there will be another panel that discusses the Skylab. And that's all I have. I got one question. The, when you went from the RL-10 to the J-2 engine, was the thrust exactly the same? Uh, no, it was not exactly the same. Like I think we got a little bit more thrust out of that J-2. Sorry about that. <laughs> actually, I actually knew Axel better than I did Booker. I hope you get an appreciation for how complicated those three stages are. Because this is something that had never been done before, and it's amazing to me that we did it. But it had to be guided. It had to be sent in the correct direction. And uh, Luke Talley will give us a little rundown of what they did with the S2 stage. And he worked for IBM. Sort of a goldish color, 
And these are cold plates, so your equipment masks to the cold plate. We're pumping coolant through this thing to keep them cool. And then the equipment is all interconnected by uh, cables running around these cable trays. These two yellow pieces here on the bottom are a couple of antennas. Okay, next slide. Uh, this thing has been called the brain of Saturn. Uh, in the 1960s, there was not a lot of digital power like you have in your pocket today. So we actually had, uh, this thing was made up of an analog computer and a digital computer. Uh, we, just about everything that happened during the flight was either directly or indirectly affected by the operation of the uh, computer system in the instrument unit. And so we had a 16,348 word digital computer. Uh, you're used to talking about bytes. That's roughly the equivalent of maybe 50,000 bytes. Your cell phone is billions of bytes. So things have come a little distance since over 50 years. We executed about 8,700 instructions a second. As, as the thing is flying, the instrument unit is sending out the commands to uh, discrete events. They call them start engine, stop engine, fire retro rockets, things like that, open valve, closed valve, as well as moving the engines to steer it to get to where you're going. And 8,700 instructions per second is, is pretty remarkable when you get right down to it. This computer had 18 instructions. Uh, complex instruction set computers today have hundreds of instructions in easy. Okay, next slide there. Okay, this is, if you go upstairs and look at the instrument unit, the launch vehicle digital computer, the launch vehicle data adapter, this constitutes essentially the digital computer. And then we have the flight control computer over here, which is an analog computer. This is actually, this combination of analog and digital is a combination is uh, similar to what IBM had done with the Air Force on the Titan missile. They actually had this similar type setup and uh, my understanding is that's why this thing is, is cylindrical. The people that built this thing had a production line that was set up and was qualified and so they said, well, we can build the cards for you for the Saturn. Uh, we got this line that makes funny shaped cards that fit in this round cylinder that slides down in the missile. Is that okay? Well, it's save a little bit of money, so a qualified line is very important. So this thing was, uh, in my understanding, it used to slide down in the Titan missile. The launch vehicle digital computer now has the memory and the processor. The launch vehicle data adapter is the input-output uh, device for the, uh, for the LVDC. Pretty much everything that comes in has to be converted to a digital form for the LVDC to use and everything the LVDC wants to send out is to be converted in a... <clears throat> okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, now, the, like I said, we didn't have enough horsepower to do everything in the digital world, so the LVDC and the LVDA, uh, they were responsible for issuing the commands to different discrete events throughout the flight. And also execute uh, did the navigation and guidance function. Okay, navigation is where am I versus where should I be, and then guidance is how do I get from where I am to where I need to be. Well, once you have done that in the digital world, then you have to send the command over to that flight control computer and say, hey, uh, wiggle that engine to get me where I'm supposed to be, and that would be the, the control function. So it would then send the commands down that actually would steer the engine or fire the thrusters on the third stage. An interesting point is that uh, at the time, the spacecraft computer system did have some integrated circuits. We did not have any integrated circuits. So the LVDC and the LVDA logic panels, they're all made up of hybrid circuits and in in Internal to these are small transistors, about a 32nd of an inch square, roughly. And uh, that would be one transistor in a 32nd of an inch. The latest system IBM has to date, there are 18 million transistors in a 32nd of an inch square area. So it's a little different world. Okay, Jack? Okay, so we've heard before that the 
you see my chart. <laughs> the IBM computer flight program controlled the S1C, S2, and S4B burns and put them up into about 117 mile high uh, orbit, Earth orbit, in about 11 minutes and 33 seconds. The system we have, you can't go directly from the Cape to the moon. We just don't have enough power to do that. So we launch, go into orbit. When the point of your orbit intersects the plane of the moon's orbit, you're in an orbit plane, but it's different from the moon's plane. When they intersect, then you restart the third stage engine again and do a burn for about six minutes. It's usually about an orbit and a half takes place before you restart. And this way you can make sure that the, none of the astronauts have chickened out. Make sure that all your equipment is ready to go. Then, about two hours, 53 minutes, you're up to around 200 miles and traveling 24,000 miles an hour. Now, following the second S4B burn, there were several maneuvers that were executed. And that's what I'm going to talk about primarily here. Most of what we've heard already before, so we'll talk about these. Jack? Okay, about 15 seconds after S4 we cut off, the instrument unit sends commands and fires the thrusters on the S4B, maneuvers this thing into the separation attitude. And this orients the vehicle so that when the crew is coming back to dock with the lunar module, the sunlight is correct, is shining so that they get good shadows and so forth. In a uh, vacuum of space, it's usually either light or dark, and so you have to control your shadows. So what they're doing is uh, setting this up. Uh, about 10 minutes later, the CSM separates, moves away from the booster. While they're, as they separate, the panels that are surrounding the lunar module are blown away off of the, the slot, spacecraft lunar module adapter. And that leaves the lunar module exposed, like you see over here. So what they're going to do is the, the, uh, the pointy end of the spacecraft, that's technical talk there, the uh, apex will dock with this, with this port here on top of the lunar module. Uh, he was talking about LA2 venting, and this shows some of the venting that's taking place from the non-propulsive vents, in fact, in this, in this case. So he comes back, docks with the lunar module, uh, about three hours, 26 minutes. So this whole process has taken about almost 30 minutes. Okay, Jack, next. Okay, about 45 minutes after they dock, they, well, when they dock, they check some cables, they uh, set some latches and do some uh, onboard checks. Then they actually throw a switch in the command module and that separates the lunar module from the booster. And then they'll pull away from it. If they look back out the window, that's what they see is what's left over of the, the S4B, the IUs, that little bitty piece in there, and then what's left over of the lower part of the uh, spacecraft lunar module adapter. Now, as soon as they do this, the, uh, there is a finite probability that this thing is going to run into the spacecraft. Between this point and the moon, you're not sure what kind of maneuvers the spacecraft will do. So. First thing you got to do is you got to do an evasive maneuver to make sure this thing does not hit the space track. So what they'll do is they'll maneuver this thing to an attitude and they'll do a nine minute thruster burn and they'll slow this thing down about six and a half miles an hour. They're traveling in the neighborhood by, they get, by the time they get to here, they're probably down to 10,000 or so miles an hour. And so they're going to slow this thing about six and a half miles an hour. Well, that's not much, but over the two and a half days going to the moon, and make sure that the distance between the spacecraft gets longer and longer and longer. Okay. Makes sense so far? Okay, Jack. I'm trying to hurry along here. They've got a lot of stuff. <laughs> Nikki's threatened to shoot me two or three times, so. <clears throat> okay, so following the separation, the command service module is going to go, so if, if we're down here, we're couple, two and a half days or so getting there. Moon's up here, moon moving, let's say. They're going to follow a trajectory, take them around the leading edge of the moon, fire their service module engine and go into orbit and do their thing. So what we're going to do now is we're going to play around with the S4B and take it off on a different direction. And on Apollo 8 through 12, 
we would uh, execute what was called a swing shot maneuver. Take this thing around, slow it down enough that it will go around the trailing edge of the moon while the spacecraft's going to go around the leading edge. We'll go around the trailing edge. If we're within 2,000, 2,500 miles of the moon, the moon's moving, so the moon's gravity then pulls this faked uh, S4 BIU and it throws it in orbit around the sun. Okay. So that's what we were going to do on 8 through 12. 13 through 17 now, we, don't, we, we slow it down a little bit less. Slow it down enough and it goes around the trailing edge. Slow it down <coughs> a little bit less and it runs into the moon. This thing hitting the moon is about like 11 tons of TNT, so it's a pretty good whack. Uh, they figured probably when they hit, produced about a two and a half hour moon quake. So all the little green folks were running out, oh my God, the Americans are back. <laughs> okay, Jack. Okay, so we'll talk a little about the slingshot. You can see up here, maneuvered the slingshot attitude in about four and a half hours. The slingshot maneuver took about 45 minutes. There's leftover propellants in the tank, so some of the propellant you pump out through the engine. Don't start it, just pump it out. And uh, <clears throat> helium bottles are vented, these various things. The S4B only rockets are fired for about five minutes. So now you're slowing it about 57 to 82 miles an hour. Get in that range and you'll do a swing shot. Outside that range, mm, something else will happen. Okay. Again, if you pass within a couple of thousand miles, you'll go into orbit about the sun. Okay, Jack. Okay, now, the other maneuver we did was the lunar impact. And see here, we're slowing anywhere from 12 to 56 miles an hour. You go 56 and a half miles an hour, who knows, flip a coin and see whether you hit the moon or go into orbit. So, for missions 13 through 17, 75 to 80 some odd hours after launch would be the time that it would hit the moon. We added an extra IU battery to power just the IU command communication system. This is an S-band transponder that's on board the instrument unit. The idea is with the transponder, the ground sends a signal out. Uh, it's like the old guy on a phone commercial. Can you hear me now? So he sends a signal out, are you there? Transponder responds, yes, I am. So this continual process, you can determine that, yep, I'm still working. So the idea was that when this thing hits the moon, guarantee you that transponder signal is going to quit. And then they would use that to correlate with the information for the seismometers to see exactly when they actually hit the moon. Okay, Jack? Okay, F, at the completion of... Uh, the slingshot or the lunar impact maneuver, whichever one it is, then they will reorient the stage somewhat. And the idea here is to keep the antennas pointed to the ground so we can track it until the, until the uh, IU batteries run out. Okay, Jack? We used to say that when the batteries depleted, Sir Isaac Newton took over control of the IU. We didn't have anything left, so he's the only guy to control it. So it's all up to physics after that. And we had a few surprises on a couple of these flights. But first, this, uh, you can go out on the internet and find some of this. It's kind of interesting. The picture on the right over there is the Apollo 13 S4B impact site. And it has a marker down there that shows about, you know, roughly that's a football field length there. So made a pretty good splat. The seismometer that we talked about, that uh, the Apollo Lunar Surface Experiment Package left on the moon surface uh, control station seismometer. This is what we were trying to trigger this thing. The idea was to determine if the moon has a, a liquid core or not, a molten core. The data was very noisy that people looked at originally and they thought, yeah, it probably got a molten core of some sort, but they weren't real sure. A few years ago, this lady, Dr. Renee Weber out at Marshall in the uh, Planetary Sciences Group, they went back and took that old data using modern signal processing techniques, cleaned it up, and determined sure enough it does have a molten core, uh, has a solid inner core kind of like the Earth, has a molten core from about 150 to about 205 miles depth there, and then it has from about 100 mile depth or from 200 to 300 is an area that is sort of between solid and, and molten. They think this is probably the uh, 
the moon is slowly cooling. The Earth molten core is kept molten primarily by uh, radiation sources that are in the center of the Earth. The moon apparently doesn't have that. And they think that over time, if we were to go back another million years from now, this area would continue to shrink down to where you would have less molten core than today. All right, I'm going to hurry on. Jack? Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about Apollo 12. Next one. Apollo 12 got hit by lightning uh, 30 seconds and 50 seconds after launch. And uh, really the instrument unit and the stages really didn't feel much from it. The guys in the spacecraft did. We actually got their data back and took, stripped it out on some trip charts. Uh, Pete Conrad's heart hardly changed at all, his heart rate when the lights went out. Uh, he had flown before and he was kind of a, a strange guy anyway. Uh, <laughs> Dick Gordon, his, his heart rate speeded up. He yeah, something's funny going on. Poor Alan Bean was the first guy, the first time he'd ever flown. His heart stopped. It skipped about three or four beats. It came back. He was in a deep field. And he was here a few weeks after that or months after that. And he admitted that, boy, when the lights went out, he thought, <laughs> the next thing I'm going to see is either God or the devil. <laughs> he said that was a bit frightening. Anyway. So what I want to do is go through quickly uh, some of the things that were done. I'm going to skip this first part. So let's go, Jack. One slide, skip another one, skip, 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 skip. All right, here we go. This is the one we're going to stick with. Next slide. All right, Apollo 12, when they got out there and did the getting ready to do the slingshot maneuver. The people at Houston thought the rocket was going faster than it actually was going. So as a result, they sent an extra command to slow it down some more. So what they did is they, uh, the onboard system slowed, about, slowed them about 62 miles an hour. Mission Control sent a five minute uh, thrust to burn command, slowed an initial 25 miles an hour. And this chart now shows that you slow 62 miles an hour, you will go into solar orbit. If you slow 82 miles an hour, the Earth's going to cap you. You're going to wind up in a very, very high orbit about the Earth. Okay. Well, luck would have it, that's what happened. Okay, Jack. Between the charts and the microphone. Well, basically, if you look at Apollo 11, Apollo 11, they're slowing down, they're slowing down. This is time from launch here, a distance from the Earth. They're slowing down 12 hours, 18, so and so on. They get out here about 72 hours, get close enough to the moon. The moon's gravity now gives them this impulse and in, in speed, speeds them back up, and then they slow them down. As long as they're above the red line, they go into solar orbit. In the case of the Apollo 12, we were going too slow because we had been slowed down by that extra burn. And it gets slow and slow and slow, and he gets near the moon and doesn't get above the red line, so he winds up in a higher Earth orbit. Well, this crazy thing stays in this orbit for about two years. And as luck would have it, or not, there's a point between the Earth and the Sun, this little chart way over here on the corner. There's a point between the Earth and the Sun. The Sun's out here, Earth's over there, about a million miles from the Earth toward the Sun, where the gravity balances. Guy JPL theory is that this thing stayed in solar orbit, uh, entered, encountered the Earth and the Moon on several of these orbits, 101,000 miles by 500,000 mile orbit, very, very elongated. And this thing probably got more and more elongated, and at some point, it got near this balance point on the sun side, and the sun actually pulled it into orbit around the sun. So we thought, well, we all knew that would happen. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, next slide. We thought that was it. Well, this is really strange because in 2002, this amateur astronomer, he's got a lot of asteroids with his name on them. So he's out there every night looking for white dots. He sees this white dot. Thinks it's an asteroid. Puts it onto the internet. I'm Bill Young. I've seen something. 
And so the professional astronomers start looking at it and say, well, uh, it's not an asteroid. The trajectory couldn't be an asteroid. Furthermore, it looked like it's coming into Earth's orbit. It's got the ancient alien astronaut get the theorist excited. They were all heading for the Devil's Tower. So the next group looked at it and said that this asteroid's covered with titanium dioxide, which is white paint. Uh, that's probably not an asteroid. So the people at JPL reconstructed the path and believed that it was this Apollo 12 S4B. So after 31 years out there, this thing had probably approached this L1 point again in space, but on the Earth's side and was pulled back into orbit about the Earth. Next slide, Jack. If you go on the internet and you search for J002E3, that's the space jump number for this Apollo 12 S4B, and look for the JPL animation, you can see this thing comes in, it's near this L1 point, it's pulled toward the Earth, makes these loops. What's interesting is watch this thing as it nears the Earth and nears the Moon, and watch the shapes of these orbits change. After about a year, this thing comes around and the moon is, is moving in this direction. This thing comes around, it's almost like the moon pulls it and throws it back into solar orbit. They're saying now, 40 years from now, it's probably going to do the same thing. And it will probably do this on a repetitive basis about every 40 years for the next thousand years, in which time it's either going to hit the earth or the moon. Some poor slob a thousand years from now is going to be walking down the street and have a Really big surprise. See that shadow getting real big real quick. I wonder what that splat is. Okay, that uh, is sort of a off the you know beaten path from the instrument unit, but it gives you. It's really interesting if you go out there and take a look at that. Jack, skip one. Go one more. Okay, this one shows uh, Apollo 12. We didn't make our slingshot. We wound up captured by the Earth. Apollo 11, we almost just barely made it, but we did go into solar orbit. And Apollo 13 was a lunar impact. So 42 miles an hour, 82 miles an hour, 88 miles an hour out of 10,000. That was pretty good shooting. So. Okay, that's it, folks. Thank you, Luke. Appreciate it. Okay, folks, uh, just, just, I was going to say we're going to ask, let some questions be asked here in just a second, though, but I'm going to tell you right now that Volker's going to pass out the questions, and uh, if you pass, you can leave the audience. Hey, what, for, stop that, man. <laughs>
software that executes this thing every two seconds. Navigation guides control, turn on, turn off stuff. Navigation guides control, turn on, turn off. And it gets interrupted by things that happen. Engine out, you know, little man turned into something. So, but we just call that the OWC. Say again? That was the term you used, adaptive guidance. Adaptive guidance is what I was talking about. Oh, well, now you, that's, that's once you get into second, third stage burn, right? First stage was time tilt. Difficulty of keeping the LH2 uh, cold uh, in the uh, third stage. How was that done for the service module? For the service module? Yeah, that ought to be kept cold for a number of days. Yeah, I, I really couldn't answer that. That's part of the, you know, the uh, uh, North American you know, crew vehicle, basically. reading that the uh, cryo tanks on the spacecraft had, I believe it was 23, 25 layers. You had a layer of uh, fiberglass, a layer of aluminized mylar, and a layer of fiberglass, a layer of aluminized mylar, and that if you put a cup of coffee in there and come back in a year, it dropped maybe two or three degrees or something like that. But that's the only thing I remember about the spacecraft as far as the tanks. Good question, though. Luke? Luke? Yes, sir. How many S4Bs actually impacted the lunar surface? Five. Five. those welds done on those uh, panels they welded together? Were they done by hand or was there some machine that did them? Or? On, on the S4B it was a machine weld. It's kind of a funny story. The, uh, the, the actual uh, panels that were built were built on you know, some, some very up-to-date new machines. Okay, When they wanted to put those together and, and do that combined weld, they ran down with the, the weld head well, they changed it that moved along that changing thickness and everything, didn't they? Yeah, they, they had planned for that, but the problem was they, the butted joint was so tight that the weld reader couldn't read where it was supposed to be going, and they ended up having a problem. The weld would just run all over everywhere. And <clears throat> they struggled with you know what they ought to do with it, and some engineer popped up and said, why don't we just take a bastard file to that damn thing and rough it up a little bit, you yeah. know? Well, nobody wanted to go on the flight hardware and do that, but they finally did use the sanding process on that edge so that the, the track of the automated welder would go right down the seam. What kind of weld? Sorry? What kind of welding were you doing? Uh, it was the, uh, I can't remember, 2214. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm talking to this one. Um, I, I can't answer that question. I really can't. Yeah, I'd, I'd be guessing at this point. Here we go. There was a question again about when you went from six Oreo can engines to the one day two. It just seemed to me like that would have been a major undertaking as far as the amount of fuel it would take to power both both sets of engines. But you you said the J two was a little bit more powerful than the six 
RL10s. It just seemed like that would have been a major impact. Uh, it, it, it was a major impact to the entire thrust structure and, and the way all of that was, was handled. Uh, the, there was always a need for additional capability out of the, you know, the, the S2 stage and the S4B stage. That's why that tank was expanded to the point that it was. That's why it was lengthened to you know, uh, the extent it was. Um, it just provided more. But, but you're right. I mean, there was a lot of plumbing that went with those RL-10s, but they were specifically designed for that vehicle to be you know, for the first uh, use of the vehicle. Okay, uh, thank you for coming. This was a, a very special one. It, it really is our, our heritage here in this area. I just want to share with you that uh, next week on Wednesday, not Thursday, but on Wednesday the 29th, uh, we will hear the Skylab story. Uh, let's see, John Thomas and his team will be here. Uh, we'll be in the same place. Uh, after it's over with, we won't have a beer garden, but maybe we all go find a place to have a beer after or something. It will it be will, in here. It will be here. Okay. Yes. Right. It will the be announced, here. The announcement I got today was it would be in this. No. Okay. That's the reason we moved it today was to, oh, okay. so we would have it we'll here. here. Right. And then um, uh, following that, uh, Marshall Lindstrom will be speaking in Discovery on the 6th of June. And, uh, and then I believe Mickey has his engineers, uh, another panel, engineers of the Paula era, and that's on the 13th of June. That's Marshall Engineers, by the way. Yes, okay. And then on the 20th, it will be the um, center directors from the Marshall Space Flight Center, and that will be over in Discovery. The, the ones I just mentioned, the last two, will be in Discovery. It's just in the next building over. It's a smaller place. We really appreciate everybody coming out today. Thank you. By the way, if you haven't, uh, not aware of it, Skylab was initially going to be what they called a wet Skylab. It was going to be outfitted on the orbit. Then it went to what they called a dry Skylab, which was fitted out on Earth and set up. If you haven't been there, I highly recommend it because that's a very interesting story about the Skylab. And I want to echo what Jack said. Thank you very much for coming and sitting through this. You do not have to take the exam. <laughs> Three, two, one, zero. We have commitment. We have liftoff.